Hello, this is Bennett Davetian again with lecture number seven in a series of lectures on organizations. This one is on the nonprofit sector. Very interesting sector and a very troublesome one. Let's first define what is a nonprofit organization or institution. Any corporation or institution whose purpose is not the making a profit is automatically a nonprofit institution. Now, I'm not talking about businesses that are failing and that wish they were making profit, but they're not. No, that doesn't qualify. The stated purpose must be not to make a profit. Their interest lies in something else. So although management can and often do collect salaries, workers collect salaries, the ultimate purpose of the enterprise is not there for profit. In fact, most profit, uh, non-profit uh, organizations are private organizations working in the public arena. One example is Greenpeace. Huge, huge institution. But they're not there to make money, although they will solicit donations, contributions, but that is for their operating costs. So don't confuse operating costs, operating salaries, uh, buildings, perks, whatever, as profit, because there is no profit, and there will be no shareholders. Wouldn't make sense. Shareholders there to have shares that produce a certain value. So any purpose other than government or business is called non-profit. Notice, other than government. We don't usually refer to the government as a non-profit sector. It, it, it confuses them. Nonprofits are private institutions. By private, we mean they're not public. They're not there owned by the state to benefit the population as state institutions. So this independent sector will often deal with government and business in order to represent their constituents. Their per let's say a nonprofit is there to represent single unwed mothers. Well, they will deal with the government, and they may deal with business in order to promote the safety and well-being of this group of people that they are representing. In England, they have public charities, they're called. They're non-profits, and they work to bring in money to finance charities. And they have stores where they sell second-hand stuff that's been contributed by people, and then that money is then sent to a variety of charities. In France, they have what they call the service economy. Again, the purpose is not to produce profit, but to render service to society and to individuals living in that society. Now, nonprofits will get funding from the government, from the business and members of the public, Corporations, governments, and individuals, private individuals, often will contribute to non-profit organizations. But these non-profits are non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and they are mandated to use any kind of income that they receive for their stated goals and activities. So you can't pocket some of the money. If you do, you then go and answer to the legal system. You're charged with embezzlement. Now, one of the reasons that we have these nonprofit organizations serving society has to do with market failure. See, the government does not service certain groups and certain ideas or proposals that these groups have. So business will be more concerned with luxury housing than housing for the poor. So a NGO will appear whose purpose is to encourage corporations to build housing for the poor and to invest in that sector. That is one example of how a free market fails and is corrected if you want, supported to go in the right direction, part of the time at least, 
by nonprofit organizations that have specific goals of rendering service. Uh, an example in the entertainment industry would be Hollywood films versus independent art films. Very often, the independent art films do not produce a profit and have to go seeking contributions, but their purpose is to investigate new forms of filmmaking and to produce films that the general public may not be interested enough to turn them into blockbusters. Uh, Robert Redford started his studio with the express idea of promoting talent that was unusual, that was outstanding, and never looking at that talent in terms of dollar figures, in terms of whether they would make tons of money or not. He succeeded, but uh, that was a byproduct of the original uh, mission, if you want. And every non-profit organization does have a mission. Look at libraries and museums. They are non-profit organizations, and, and they do not seek profitability, but due to the volume of their holdings, unlike bookstores, uh, a good book that is not selling will be sent back. Now, I'm confusing this. A bookstore will send back a book that's not selling, but a library will have tons of books and some of these books may have had readers, 200 readers, but they're important books. And the library will decide to acquire them. Because again, freed from the desire to produce profit, they can go for knowledge for its own sake. I wish all of society was like that myself. Uh, we'd have a great time and we'd know much more than we already know. But that is a personal preference. So the less homogeneity the less everybody being the same we have the more need for NGOs now, I, see, I hope you see the logic here in a society of conformists where everybody wants the same thing has the same lifestyle corporations can create an environment that pleases everybody but in a society that encourages diversity, encourages individualism, a lot of smaller groups will form that cannot be justified in a capitalistic manner. I mean, a corporation has only so much money it can invest. It's got to put it where it does the more efficient uh, good and brings in the most efficient return. So these groups that are not being serviced because of this diversity, then acquire NGOs that come to represent them, and they can become the, the reason of existence of that particular NGO. NGOs also come up when there's a failure in trust. Recall contract failure. In the civil rights movement, uh, when the state in the 50s and 60s was not sufficiently protecting the racial rights of different races, NGOs were created and they stepped in with thousands of volunteers and thousands of financial contributors to form a movement that would encourage the state to pass laws that would prohibit discrimination and laws that would increase the educational opportunities of those minority groups that were citizens at that time. I'm talking about the African Americans, but they were being denied what others had. So, NGOs usually require flexibility because they're dealing with change, and they emerge from change, encourage change and then have to adapt and develop a structural system that allows them to service this new environment that they're bringing forward without going into chaos and without creating unintended consequences that end up making them do more harm than good. It's a dangerous business to be in. So 
one of the last questions we would ask is how are nonprofits different? Their bureaucratic forms are in common. Every institution needs bureaucracy. Yet, because the, some of them don't need a regular and consistent income, they can avail themselves of volunteers. And they become less concerned with efficiency and more concerned with breadth of operations and more concerned with morale. Uh, an organization can forget morale if it's after profit whereas an NGO can bring together a bunch of excited people and make things work, even with very minimal funds or no funds, because these people are there because they are committed to a cause, committed to a mission. So ideally, the work and social individual that is in the work will align in terms of social and human and personal values. The commitment of the members is everything. The group identification, the creation, the feeling of an in-group that is working together for a cause, are what fuel NGOs of different sizes. So they are value-driven, they are idealistic, and they have a collective agreement to be sympathetic with one another. It's amazing how NGOs in different areas have a common identity they share, the fact that they're NGOs, the fact that they're trying to increase social justice, and the fact that they're trying to affect change. So sometimes when they come together, they can be a very, very powerful force, although their individual missions may be different. You see this in art festivals, for example. Different art groups come together, and before you know it, you have an event that people wouldn't miss, and it happens every year, and is extremely successful. The Edinburgh Book Festival, for example, or the Edinburgh for Arts Festival in Scotland, is the most amazing collection of publishers and, and, and artists and authors. It is things that people go to as a lifelong commitment. I know one person who lives in Paris, uh, his name is Haynes, very famous person who has conversation salons in his studio. He's had these for years, every Sunday night. An amazing professor at the Sorbonne. And he will not miss the festival in Scotland because that is where so much creativity is shared and transmitted from one person to another, one organization to another. So there's three sectors that are intersecting. You have the state, you have the nonprofit, registered with the state as a nonprofit organization. You have to declare that you're a nonprofit. And sometimes states prefer to hand over projects to the NGOs, the nonprofits. They find it simpler to fund the nonprofit, let them do the work. So there's a crossover very often. Uh, so government can support the welfare state while appearing to reduce it. It's, it's amazing how, how hypocritical this gets sometimes. You can go and get elected saying, oh, we need to dis decrease our social services and save money and all that. And then you can fund a nonprofit that starts giving precisely those same services and you get away with it as a government. So the boundaries between the states and the nonprofits are weakened, and they're more weakened in socialist type of countries than they would be in other types of countries where the state really controls. Uh, in dictatorships, for example, the state controls activities that are social, and in highly capitalistic competitive environments. The partnering between the NGO and the state provides the NGO with a legitimacy as well as a policy platform that it can comfortably follow without punitive actions taken by the state. 
the danger that the NGO faces is becoming too governmental and losing its values, becoming a bureaucracy that is connected to the state and agrees with the state and forgets that its mission may be different from what the state would like it to be. So state funding puts operational goals and limits on NGOs. Let's face it, it's unavoidable. Yet, you can partner with the state while keeping a critical attitude towards the state. Many manage to retain an independence, if you want, an independent voice that continues and is heard despite the advantages that are being afforded to the nonprofit organization. And sometimes they split, they create spin-offs, and this may help create, uh, rather avoid, the role conflict they would feel if they were staying in what has become a sort of an impossible situation. Because you can sometimes have a lot of conflict when you're serving two masters, when you're trying to serve the public, and you're also serving the state. NGOs have become very, very important as the public has become more aware of pressing issues that need solving. The environment, the rights of minorities, uh, I mean, this can go on and on and on. Immigration, refugees, uh, accident victims, victims of crime. We can go on. The, 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 the protection of animals. The SPCA, they're not there to make money. They're there to protect animals. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. That's what SPCA stands for. So I, I'm fascinated by NGOs. It does not mean that there's no politicking inside the organization. It does not mean that they cannot become dysfunctional. Not at all. In fact, that is a very dangerous environment for social human interactions within the organization because you can't suddenly stop everybody and say, well, look, this is not helping us make money. You can say this is not in keeping with our mission. But you can have the same ego conflicts, the same power conflicts in desires for higher titles that you'll find in a for-profit corporation because you're dealing with human nature. It's individuals interacting. You're going to have this whether you like it or not. But that is basically the reality of NGOs. They are there not to make money, but to advance a cause and provide a service within that cause. Thank you for listening.